You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about sports in the state of Michigan? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, the show that provides research and statistics about all the Detroit and Michigan sports teams, whether fans like it or not, and detects, exposes, and reveals actual and hidden facts and truth that the mainstream media doesn't want you to know. No junk, no entertainment, no homerism, no slappiness, no coddling, no pop culture, no conspiracy theories, no opinions, no shilling, and no fluff. Head over to our website at michigansportstruth.weebly.com Follow us on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at Michigan underscore truth. And like and share our verified Facebook page, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast. Also listen to us on Spreaker, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts via iTunes, Google Play on its podcast mobile app, and Spotify. The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And episode 336 is on the air. This is the Week in Review edition. I'm Taylor Phillips along with Buck Gino and Ed Smith. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at DT2Phillips. Follow Ed Smith on Twitter at Ed. Smith 313 also on Instagram on Ed Smith at Ed Smith 313 and Buck Gino on Twitter at Buck Gino the third three eyes for Roman numerals how you guys doing pretty good good how are you good all right so yeah quite well all right good good gonna talk about a major story and then we'll uh, recap football and preview the Red Wings so let's get to it right away. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this special report. That one is long gone. According to Cranes Detroit and The Spun, Cleveland Cavaliers and Jack Entertainment LLC owner Dan Gilbert has been in serious discussions about purchasing the Tigers. In order to do that, he would have to sell all of Jack Entertainment LLC, which includes six casinos and racetracks, which can free up at least enough of his money. A report from Bloomberg last Thursday said that was under consideration, quote unquote. That was that was uh, like two Thursdays ago, actually. Dan Gilbert said to the media that he is interested in buying the franchise. Now, the two reasons why it may be a good move are because current Tigers owner Chris Illich is an owner that doesn't care or have passion for sports, unlike his father Mike when he was alive. That's that's one of the reasons why he's selling the team. That's that's uh, along with the Red Wings. Chris Hillich is selling the t- Tigers, and due to also due to tax issues. And reason number two, Marion Illich is also forbidden from forbidden from owning the Tigers since she owns Motor City Hotel Casino. But there was only one big problem about that move. Like Buck pointed out, Dan Gilbert Dan Gilbert over overpays his players and doesn't treat his front office personnel well. That's two problems. For example, like Ed pointed out, he he goes through uh, bad general manager after bad general manager. So this this is uh, a pretty rough, pretty uh, rough deal between Chris Illich and Dan Gilbert. Chris Illich, not a good owner. Dan Gilbert, probably not a good owner either. Which is, which is worse? We can dis, we could argue we could distinguish which is worse, but. We were we were now even Chris Illich is even worse than Dan Gilbert, but Dan Gilbert still isn't good enough. Ed, we'll start with you. Yeah, um, very logical reasoning. I understand why some people would, would have that link of Dan Gilbert to the Tigers because you know Gilbert is a local boy. Um, I believe what didn't he went to Michigan State or something like that effect? But he still he has local ties to this area. I know he's friends with Tom Izzo. Amongst other uh, people, and of course, uh, friends with Tom Gorris as well. So it wouldn't necessarily surprise me to see uh, a, a move of this nature come about because it's something that has been discussed about and um, and hampered about, you know, by by either by journalists and or fans alike for years now because of the obvious connections and well links that were established. Now, I probably would have been a proponent of uh, the four argument, saying that 
sure, no problem. I got no problem with buying it. If it wasn't for the fact that, you know, this this is pretty much more shard than anything else, the fact that as your tenorship, as an owner, because that, that should be used as a judging criteria to me, to determine on what you can potentially do as the owner of this potential franchise, uh, the fact that twice during your tenure as owner of the Cavaliers, you somehow, some way, managed to find yourself in a position where you were the greatest player of this generation, possibly the greatest player of this walk away from you. Not once, but twice. Okay, the first time was when he was unable to surround LeBron James with the right amount of talent to compete for a championship. And no, signing an old, fat, out of uh, out of his prime shelf, former shelf, Shaquille O'Neal does not count. And in the second tenure, going around with uh, with LeBron, it was just finding some way or another to undermine him at every term. Whether it would be trading Kyrie Irving when LeBron told him, no, please don't do that. Or getting rid of the general manager, David Griffin, when LeBron uh, obviously would not have liked that as well. So you see all these moments and movements and, and uh, decision making by my guy. And let's not forget also LeBron the first time to go to Miami. He put out that dip. Dan Gilbert did put out that infamous letter in common sense, common sense type font, you know, basically sounding like an, an, a, a fitter act when you get over being jumped at the prom. So you have that type of emotional uh, hostility uh, being involved with your personal makeup and all that, and on your track record of what you've done so far as known as sports. Yeah, you have a chemistry on your map, but that's only because the greatest player to walk this planet felt enough mercy and compassion and quite frankly felt more of a bigger man uh, than I would ever have been in that situation. If that was me, I was going to be uh, being honest with you on that. He found it in his heart to bypass all that in order to bring a championship to his home. Not for you, okay? You selfish idiot, but for his home. So, for Dan Gilbert to sit up there over the years and try to take more credit than they already should have was reeks of uh, arrogant uh, temperament, and just another reason why I do not want this guy anywhere near my baseball team. Absolutely not. Buck? Uh, uh, whether you want Dan Gilbert or not, um, you know, the owner is the one position where you really can't control who's there because that those decisions are made far and above any sort of, uh, you know, any, any sort of decision making that, that we would be able to influence as fans, be able to influence as as uh, people that, that broadcast uh, their opinions. Uh, Dan Gilbert, for, for all his foibles, is looking to inject cash into a team that is right now looking to skate by uh, the, the cheapest possible way to get uh, to get nine guys out there. To get 25 guys on its roster. LV is being allowed to rebuild this team because of Chris Illich's loyalty to him through his father. And knowing that he can rebuild by basically telling him what to do. Um, and I, I don't see that the general manager is going to have any different sort of relationship with Dan Gilbert than he would with Chris Illich simply because... Dan Gilbert likes to have his hands in it. Chris Illich likes to have his hands in it. They, they've both been noted, widely noted as macro, uh, micromanagers. Uh, the difference is that Dan Gilbert's going to open his wallet. I don't like uh, how he is, he's operated his team at times. I don't like his public persona. As when, I, when Ed talked about the letters of Brad James, um, that reeked of immaturity and selfishness. Um, all of those things said, um, you don't get to choose an owner. You can you can cry all you want about the general manager, about the players, about the front office personnel. Those are all the things that fall into the purview of the owner. The owner, whoever wants to, if they have enough money, they're going to they're gonna try to buy the team. And whether or not he, Dan Gilbert, is, is divesting all these properties or going to divest all these properties 
so that he can have uh, room to spare to buy another major league franchise, and perhaps two. Um, you know, there's not really going to be anybody that can stop him except for the league. And so, um, this is something that, you know, people will say, oh, I don't want him to buy the team, or boy, I hope he buys the team. Um, we can have those thoughts, and those are valid thoughts, and, those, and you can have criticism and an argument about it, but uh, it's my opinion that uh, the owner is going to be whoever wants to have, whoever has the checkbook, whoever has the most money to buy the team. Whether that be Dan Gilbert, whether that be Steve Ballmer, whether that be Chris Illich. I mean, Chris Illich was a de facto owner. you got to remember that he was never really the owner of the Tigers until his father passed away. Yeah, he held top positions in the Illich Empire, but when Mike died, he became the owner. He didn't spend his own money to get there. And so you're looking at an owner who, by his own means, is going to be able to buy the team. And uh, whether or not he has a great track record as an owner, um, uh, you know, we, you can't prevent that. You can't prevent anybody from that. If Mark Cuban walked in tomorrow and said he wanted to buy the Cubs, um, you know, people were talking about him. He had made a bid for the Cubs and it failed before. Um, Ty Ricketts bought that franchise and overhauled it. And I think it's time for a culture change for both franchises. Um, there are both teams in transition. The Red Wings, after a lengthy tradition of winning for 25 years, the Tigers, more recent vintage in the last decade before they fell off the grid of winning baseball. And Mike Illich was responsible for both of those because he picked the right people. He put the people in place that he knew he could trust. And he also had no problem with spending money when those people he could trust said that he needed to. So if Dan Gilbert becomes the owner of the Tigers, for the purpose of this conversation right now, the Tigers, uh, maybe not the Red Wings, I think that the you know, I'm sure that in the short term it will change for the better because he's going to be spending money, and that's just, that's the thing that you need to be able to do to be competitive. You cannot consistently win without having money spent. Now, granted, there are exceptions to that rule, and every year we see that exception. Uh, there's always a team that doesn't have a, a big payroll that ends up making the playoffs. Uh, Oakland Athletics are one. Um, Tampa Bay is another but at the same time those teams are at distinct disadvantages when compared to their peers because they have limited resources whether it be by choice or whether it be by necessity so um, you know it's a tough spot for fans because fans want to change fans want a different culture fans want guys that will go out there and, and spend like Mike Gillich. You're not going to find many owners like Mike Gillich. They'll, they'll, they don't exist in every street corner. Mike Gillich was an owner that understood the fans' concerns because he was a fan, but he also understand the, understood the business side of it. And Dan Gilbert, for, in, in, for all the times he has done things wrong and, and, and potentially mismanaged things like the general managers of his team, I mean, he was able to get LeBron to come back, whether that was because of David Griffin more than Dan Gilbert or not. Um, he was responsible for that because he had to open the checkbook and, and pay him. So when, when you're looking at things like why LeBron clashed with Dan Gilbert, well, LeBron clashed with Dan Gilbert because LeBron wanted to shape the team in his image. He felt that if he was going to come back, he was going to be able to be the end-all, be-all when it came to personnel decisions, when it came to what team, what guys he wanted on the team, what guys he didn't want on the team, what general managers, what coaches. It became all about LeBron James. Now, I'm not going to tell you that that's bad or good because, obviously, Le- LeBron James uh, being the star player and wanting to, to shape the team around him, uh, that kind of makes sense. I mean, Michael Jordan, when he was with the Bulls, I mean, I'm very confident that he made decisions that he aired to Jerry Reinsdorf at the time when they were winning six championships. I mean, there were times where they didn't agree. And 
I, I think that people kind of lose focus of what needs to happen or what, what should happen to these teams, which is the success on the field, but you also have to make some money. And I think that when teams like the Red Wings and the Tigers have had a, a long-standing order like Mike Illich pass away, uh, there's going to be some apprehension. There's going to be some turmoil because it's not the same person. Chris Illich inherited that team. He, he didn't do any sort of work to make himself the controlling owner of, of that franchise. So his, his goal is not going to be the same as somebody coming in and buying the team that is looking to turn a profit, but also have a competitive team on the field. Because you can make money without, with, with, with semi-competitive teams, but you can't have it as a, as a sustainable business model. And Chris Hillish right now is concerned about the bottom line, number one. How much money is he going to make? How much can he take away without losing money? And so far, his plan has worked out at this point to his benefit. So I, I, this, this news about Dan Gilbert wanting to buy the Detroit Tigers or possibly wanting to buy the Detroit Tigers, uh, I, I think that people have to be very careful when they say they don't want Dan Gilbert to buy it or they don't want somebody else to buy it because it, it doesn't really, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but it, it's very hard for people to, to grasp what that owner is going to be able to do or what they want to do with the franchise. Now, Dan Gilbert could buy the team and they could become complete train wrecks. But everybody remembers when Tom Gore bought the, the Pistons from the Davidson family, everybody thought, oh, this is wonderful. You have a guy that's going to infuse capital into a team that desperately needs it, and they have very little to show for it so far with Tom Gore being the owner. So... I don't know if that's going to be the same type of situation with Dan Gilbert, but it, it, you know the, the owner is something that is just way, is well outside the realm of any sort of control or of desires of, of fans, and it, it, it doesn't do a lot of good to complain about the owner because uh, you know, it's like the Lions. People have complained about the Lions for so many years. But the ownership group has remained the same. So if, until they sell the team, those issues are going to remain. And as long as the Lions are held by the Ford family, those issues are going to remain because they had the same philosophy. So I, I, I don't know really what to make of it other than if Dan Gilbert does indeed make an offer and is, is successful, you have to hope that that team can overcome some of his idiosyncrasies and his his style of ownership if that if that is going to hold true because if you look at the Cavaliers I mean the, the Cavaliers were owned by Dan Gilbert but LeBron James made the Cavaliers you can have an owner that does all the right things spends all the right money but if they don't have a star it's going to be very difficult. So I think that if Dan Gilbert comes on board as the owner of the Tigers, you're looking at somebody who's going to spend some money to try to get that star, to try to get that player that can have a team built around them. And whether that's right or wrong, uh, we'll, we'll, that will remain to be seen. But I, I think that we kind of get lost in the in the shuffle of, well, we want this to go this way, we want this to go that way. Well, if we had enough money to do that, we would probably be able to do that. Uh, we would go out and buy the team because we have that type of money, but we don't. So, um, Dan Gilbert, yeah, he's, he's done a lot of a lot of things that have turned people the wrong way. Um, he's treated people maybe not in the manner that the others think that he should, but when you're signing the checks, you kind of get to do whatever you want. So, uh, all of that said, I, I really think that a change is needed, and we all agree that the change is needed. But when you come to that crossroads of who's going to be the person to make those changes, um, your, your field of potential suitors is going to be limited because you have to be able to afford the team. You can't just say, oh, I wish so-and-so was the owner because that, he'd be great. Well, uh, 
is they have to want to own the team. And so I think that if somebody like Dan Gilbert, again, n- not the most perfect owner, not somebody that everybody enjoys necessarily, um, he brought a championship to the city of Cleveland. He spent the money to make it happen. And I think that if that's going to be the end result, you have to ask yourself the question, would you rather be happy with the owner because he does all the things that you would do? Or would you be happy with the championship instead? I'm not saying that Danny Gilbert buying the Tigers is going to get the championship. I'm just saying that you have somebody that wants to own the team if he does make an offer. And if he wants to own the team, that means that he wants to do enough to get them to a championship level. So, in that regard, I think that Dan Gilbert would be a, a, an okay choice because he's showing the initiative. He's the one that's making the bid. That doesn't mean he's going to do. He's not going to have. He's going to have success, or that means he's going to fail. But it just means that he wants to be able to, to own that team. And his track record has been. Dan Gilbert's track record has been if he has a, a star, he's, he's going to have a, a successful team. Well, that's pretty much the, the formula for a lot of franchises. If you have a star, you're going to be good. So if Dan Gilbert is willing to infuse some capital and, and find that star and get the Tigers back to the, the level that most fans have enjoyed for the past uh, 15 years save the last couple um, yeah it, it might not feel great but like I said you have to ask yourself that question do you want to feel good about the owners or do you want a championship and a lot of times those don't align yeah I will say though I will say though I understand the business and financial and economic aspect of Dan Gilbert making this type of investment because in a way it would be him putting more money into the city, into the city of Detroit, something that he has done on a consistent basis over the past few number of years and something that I have no problem with him doing, but I commend him for it. That being said, that being said, I still have the right, you know, to feel uneasy given his track record and, and there are red flags there and it appears that to me, I'm going to call it as I see it. Um, as for Gilbert himself, you know, and if I was a Cleveland Cavaliers fan, you know, of course I would have been happy and satisfied with the championship, even if it meant uh, giving uh, Dan Gilbert some sense of credit, because at the end of the day, he is the one that signs the checks. He is the one that, you know, oversees the whole operation. So you're correct in that aspect. But still, when the time comes and there are choices along the way, uh, and moments show how, again, in terms of uh, temperament, personality, other factors, you would not feel quite comfortable with him as your owner, in my opinion. Like, I'm sure there's Dallas Cowboys fans, love the championships, they love the Super Bowl trophies, but they're tired of Jerry Jones now. So you can still be appreciative of the championships, but if you dislike or don't like a direction where it's headed, you can still feel the need to voice uh, whatever criticisms you might have about ownership if you feel it's not being satisfactory to your needs, to your specific needs at that time. Right. And I'll agree with that. The only thing for I'll say to that is Jerry Jones owned the team. He, he brought in Jimmy Johnson, and we all know how that worked. Now, that was pre-NFL salary cap era, but it, it, it hinges upon you getting stars, and being able to spend that money to bring in whoever the heck you want, if you, if, if you'll have if you'll meet your price, and people are tired of Jerry Jones now because the dog and pony show isn't getting them winning football teams, and Jerry Jones before uh, you know, nineteen you know early nineties and when he actually went in and bought the team and reshaped it, everybody loved him. Because they are winning. And now Cowboys fans are probably a little bit more disenfranchised because all of the things that he's done, new stadium, new everything, he still likes his hands to be in, in the middle of it. He still thinks himself as a coach or a de facto general manager 
I mean, take, take for instance today, and I know we'll get to the Lions Cowboys game. The press, he was in the press conference. How many owners? How many owners do you know that would be inserted into a press conference talking about the team? Owners are there to do what they're supposed to, which is sign the check. And you want them to, to hire guys that can do the job and let them do the job. And I think that Detroit fans, especially Red Wings and Tigers fans, were spoiled about that because Mike Illich, he never made it about him. He always made it about who he put in place. And if those people in place needed him to spend the money, he always had the open checkbook. He was never unwilling to sign people if it meant that the team was going to be more successful. And it's just a, it's a it's a paradigm shift from a Mike Illich who is really uh, an overgrown fan. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Uh, he was an overgrown fan, but he also had the business acumen and the respect that allowed him to hire people and put them in place to make those teams successful. And you know we can we can talk about. A lot of different things when it comes to owners and what they do and what they don't do. But, I mean, in Detroit, you have very, until Mike Yellish passed away, you had very polarizing philosophies between the Lions and Mike Yellish's team. Even though, because I was, I'll use the Ford family as an example, because the Ford family, there was no, there is not a track record of success. It just is not there. And there's no argument about it. Whereas Mike Illich took teams and he bought teams like the Red Wings when he bought them were more terrible. Um, when he bought the Tigers, they were not good. And he grew them and it wasn't overnight into sustainable, successful teams. And whether Dan Gilbert can do that or not, um, I, I think his track record of building sustainable, successful teams can be somewhat criticized because not everybody can have LeBron James. But at the same time, he showed the willingness and the desire to field a competitive team. And now some people can question that because he was at odds with his team's best player and also one of, if not the best player in NBA history and how to form a team. Um, but that's another discussion for another time. I think that when you look at it, Dan Gilbert was willing to put a team out there that he could compete for titles with. And I'm not saying that Dan Gilbert's the right choice, but I don't think there's a lot of other guys or groups that are out there that right now are interested in that franchise that can say the same thing. And so if Dan Gilbert's interested um, I think that we all we all kind of agree that the path that Chris Illich has them on is not the path to success, is not the path to keeping fans involved and bringing teams that people can get behind. But at the same time, yeah, Dan Gilbert may do that, but you also may not like how he does it. And so it, it's an interesting I guess it goes back to you. do you want championships or do you want to to feel like you're comfortable and 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 be able to get behind the team because you really like the owner? Um, those are things that are just very difficult in today's world. Um, you know, Mike Illich was one of the, the last of a, a really dying breed where he was able to balance those those two things. And it's, it's very difficult to find those types of owners now. And I think that um, if, if Dan Gilbert does go forward and actually does make a bid and is successful, whether or not you, you really like it or not, and we can sit here and, and talk about what we don't like and what we do like, because that's our right as fans. Um, I think that the, the Tigers are in sore need and of... And as co-host, too, of this podcast. Right. I mean, I think that I think the Tigers are in sore need of a different direction. And rebuild, rebuilding is one thing. Rebuilding is great because you have to do it. Every team goes through it. But if you bring somebody in that's willing to accelerate that process and do it responsibly, 
that's something you have to be able to listen to as a fan and say, you know what, I, I don't like Dan Gilbert, how he treats front office personnel. I don't like that he likes to kind of micromanage what he has on his team. But at the same time, he does have the track record of spending money and putting together championship teams. So then all said, um, it's going to play out here in the next two to four months. I'm sure that if he's going to do this, it's going to happen sooner rather than later. Because if these reports are coming out, smoke means fire a lot of, t- a lot of times. So if, if he's coming out and saying, or if people are coming out and saying that he's going to make this move for the Tigers and do all these steps that he needs to take, it shows a, a willingness and a desire on his, po- on his part to bring back championship baseball to Detroit. And he, you may not like how he does it, and it may end up badly. But that's the that's the the end goal of all professional sports teams is winning a championship. And if you're not going to get closer, you're getting farther away. So I, this will be very interesting to see if he does become the owner, what his steps are to make that happen. Yep. Also, I'd like to add on that uh, as an owner, you have to treat your front office personnel with more respect. But but um, also, you got to make business decisions too. Right, and that's that's the thing is you know when people run businesses, sometimes those decisions aren't fun. And when you run a business, whether it be a sports team, a restaurant, a bank, anything. When, when you're the owner, when you make those decisions, people look at those decisions and they'll criticize them because they may directly affect them or maybe they don't like how that, that went down. Uh, I'm sure that not every single person liked Mike, some of Mike Gillich's decisions, but I can tell you that over the balance of his tenure as owner of the Tigers and the Red Wings, um, it wasn't a lot of decisions that people shook their head at because he was coming from a perspective of a fan because he was a guy that wanted to have successful teams and he would stop literally at nothing to make that happen. Dan Gilbert's not that type of owner. He's the type of guy that will get you, get you to a championship probably by spending money, but that may mean that you're going to have some decisions that fans aren't comfortable or, or downright don't like. But at the same time, that's what they want. So sometimes we get what we want because it happens and it may not be the way we like it that happens. And sometimes we get what we want because of how we think it should happen. So um, it's an interesting, like I said, it's an interesting story um, that Dan Gilbert is now in play. And I think a lot of people thought that he would do this eventually. Um knowing the, the fact that he, with his Michigan ties and all these other things, I think it was a matter of time before this happened. And now with Chris Illich and, and the Tigers being in their current state, I think this is probably the best time for whether it be Dan Gilbert or somebody else to make that move. Yeah, absolutely. So um, all that being covered, speaking of the Tigers, they finish. 64 and 98, the fifth worst record in Major League Baseball, meaning they get the fifth overall pick in the 2019 MLB draft. Who could it be? That's, we'll have to find out. Well, it was at least knowing that this um, train wreck roller coaster of a season, that a season that many of us have did would be bad and were proven right eventually. Uh, we're proven right. Uh, it finally came to an end. While I was disappointed, obviously, uh, they felt the need to ruin my dream of getting 100 losses because they wanted to make Victor Martinez feel good on his last home game. At least it came close. It be. You know, exactly. But hey, 98 losses is still pretty darn good. Um, and we still get a top five pick. Um, I like the process of what we've done uh, over the past couple of years of some of our draft picks. I want to see 
how else we can do in terms of shoring up our outfielder okay, our outfield spot because we definitely do need that. And eventually, of course, uh, another first baseman because Mickey is not going to be there forever. Also, hopefully you get some type of, you get one or the other with whoever's available with that, with that number five pick. And that's even assuming uh, no one else wants to make any deals with you to give you a better package deal. Yep. Buck? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Tiger season was, before, before it started, was predicted to be basically what it ended up being, a a rebuilding year where guys were forced into action that probably weren't ready or may not have had the seasoning that people normally uh, associate with, with having a major league starting position, but that's what rebuilds are. You're, you're putting guys out there that may not normally be there on a contending team because if you're a contending team, they, they wouldn't have that problem. So, um, you know, 64 98 was pretty close to what a lot of people predicted. I didn't think they would get over 70 wins, and uh, I stood by that, and they didn't. Um, you know, after May, when people started to get a little bit excited about where they were in terms of the win-loss column, um, you know, people started to think, hey, maybe if this just happens and that happens. But with this team that they had constructed, it certainly was not anything more than a pipe dream for them to be contending anywhere near close to the trade deadline. And we obviously saw the rest of that season go the way that most people had scripted it. And so it's done. They have another top five pick. Um, I would say that they need to find some sort of I would say, I don't want to say generational, but I would say a very highly rated bat. You have not had one come through the Tiger system in quite some time. You've not had a position player that has been drafted by the, the, the Detroit Tigers at the top of a draft that has made any sort of bones in, I would say, 20 plus years. And people can point to Nick Castellanos. Well, uh, that's great that he is a hitter, but there's other things you have to do on the baseball field other than hit. And he's proven that he's not been able to be serviceable in the defense. All right. So, I mean, you can talk about Nick Castellanos being a bat, but I'm talking about a player that can be counted on. And I'm not going to say you're going to get the next Bryce Harper, but a, a, a player of that caliber, a position player, that is something that they can build around because they built around pitching in the last period of success that they had. I mean, they were armed and stocked with pitchers, starting pitchers beyond belief, and they made moves to further bolster that. But they still did not have a homegrown position player that you could look at and say, boy, that, that was a great pick. And I think that's what they really need to look at here is a positional player that will be able to be heralded as a, a beacon of hope for the franchise's immediate future. Whether that happens at five or not, that remains to be seen. But um, you know, they've got the pitching in in, in the system as is almost as much as they can have, and you're going to have to hope that those guys pan out and are able to come to the major league level and do what other guys have done in the past. You know, I mean, you're not going to have another Justin Verlander, but you're hoping that you can get some guys out of the last three drafts that they've had, and plus um, some of the moves they've made to strip down the roster and, and assets and the players that they've gotten from there. Um, some of those guys pan out as major league pitchers that are effective and, and able to be a part of a contending team, but you can only spend so much money on, on position players and they have to find somebody. And I, position wise, I'm really not even that picky as to where they come from or where they go, but they need to find a, a transcendent talent that's plays in, that plays in the field and that can really be a linchpin in that lineup because right now they just don't have one 
Miguel Cabrera is aging. He's not going to be around forever. Uh, even though his contract feels like it's going to, he's going to be here forever. Um, he's going to, he's going to age and probably not do it well as he's already shown. So they need to find somebody that can be the next Miguel Cabrera, Bryce Harper. Keep on going down the line. They need to find that position player. It's not going to be easy. It's easier said than done than, than say, oh, yeah, I want, the, I want the next Harper. I want the next Mike Trout. I want the next Altuve or whatever. But I do agree with the standpoint. It's about time that you need to start trapping from within. There's a reason why, you know, one reason why the Golden State Warriors became the Golden State Warriors is because they built from within, you know. So um, the free the the acquisitions, the signings, the trades, it's all nice, but still – to be that consistent winner, you need to prove that you can build from within. And the Tigers have just, like you said, Buck, have not done that for a long time. So the star, the more they can start doing that, they, again, they have a couple of good guys, Verlander being the obvious uh, uh, golden gem. But again, some of their most, most important, other than that, their most important transaction deals over this past 15 year period have been either through trade or free agency. So you got to wonder. When is that trend going to eventually change? So you have to hope it's sooner rather than later. Right. And you look at the teams that are contending now, the teams that are playing either in Game 163 tomorrow, or the teams that have already clinched divisional championships, every one of those has a guy, and I'm talking about a, re- a guy that is the center or at least a big part of that organization that was drafted mm-hmm. by that organization. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and not only that, he's a versatile, uh, multi-purpose, you know, not necessarily all the way a five-tool player, but still, he's more than just one certain type. He's not going to be, oh, he's a hitter, oh, he's a bomber, or oh, he's a fielder. No, he can field, he can hit, he can do all sorts of things. That's the kind of guy that you want to draft consistently into your into your franchise. Right, and, and, the, and the draft is a crapshoot like it is in any other sport, of course. But they, but they need to be able to to find find one. And I don't care what round they come from. But if you're picking at five, that means all your other picks are going to be right around there. And you should be when you're picking at the tops of those rounds, you should have a better chance than most to pick somebody out of there and get a player of that caliber. So we'll see what happens. I know there's a lot of talk about different players and who they could draft. Um, it's, it's really going to boil down to can Al Avila, who so far, draft-wise, has been, I don't want to say great, but I don't want to say he's been bad. He's been kind of in the middle. He's going to have to kind of, no pun intended, hit a home run on this draft and get that position player. Because like I said, I think they're pitching... Um, they've they've done about all they can there. There's only so many pitchers you can draft before you start to say, "Boy, we, we really kind of went the wrong way on that." We, none of these guys have developed, so it's not only a, a drafting thing; it's also an organizational thing. You know, getting those guys in the right position to succeed, developing developing them along the way, and I think that. There's some light at the end of the tunnel when you look at some of the recent draft picks that the Tigers have had, but that doesn't mean that they're going to push past teams like the Cleveland Indians or the New York Yankees or anything else like that. They need a a, a, a linchpin to that lineup, and because they're not looking to contend in the next two three years, they're going to have that time to develop that player, and so if they can get that player at five, I'm all for it. I want to touch on Miguel Cabrera. He, right now, he's still 35 years old. He'll turn 42 by the at the time his contract expires. It's a long, long contract. That, that, and he's getting paid like 30 to 32 million per year. Holy shit! Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the price you pay. I mean, sometimes people say, "Why do you sign him to contracts that long and with that much money?" Well. If you don't, somebody else will. Exactly. When you have a talent like Miguel Cabrera, when his when his contract was up or his contract extension came to be a, a, a topic, um, yeah, it was a 
it wasn't a great catch. I mean, look at the Red Wings. They did the same things with Henrik Zetterberg, Pat Meldasuk. Uh, you know, they, they signed players to contracts where you look at it on paper, you're like, oh, man, what, what are they doing? Well, if you don't do it, somebody else will. And that's the price you pay as a, an owner is sometimes you're throwing good money right after bad because, yeah, Miguel Cabrera at 42 is not going to be the same as Miguel Cabrera that he was at 30. But you can't just say, hey, I'm going to sign you to 38 or 37 because I think that's when the gas tank is going to run out because they will find somebody else. I mean, Max Scherzer is a prime example. Max Scherzer was offered a contract. He, he turned it down. He went to the Washington Nationals, who gave him a substantially larger contract. And obviously that hasn't turned out the way that they thought it would. But that's the kind of money you got to spend if you're going to have those types of players in your lineup. And it may not be, it, it may not be the, the best move, but it's also going to be the one that you have to make if you want to have your team contend now. And the best owners and the best general managers are the ones that can maneuver through those contracts and get out while they're getting good, so to speak, when those contracts start to look a little bit hairy. You know, maybe they trade a guy here before he really comes into his own. J.D. Martinez is a perfect example. J.D. Martinez this year exploded for the Red Sox because he was signed as a free agent and they gave him a ton of money and he did exactly what the contract ordered. Is he going to be able to do that in three years? That's going to be the question and I don't think that'll be the answer. I don't think that he will be able to but you have to do that because if the Red Sox would have stepped up and offered him the contract somebody else most certainly would have. And if you're going to be a contending team, sometimes you have to spend some money that you don't want to spend. It may, be, it may be at the tail end of somebody's contract when they're not the same player that they were, but you got to do it because if you don't, it's going to be infinitely harder for you to go to the next free agent that has the same or similar capability and say, hey, we really, we really like you. Here's the contract we want to offer you. It makes it harder. It makes it a harder sell. Yeah, kind of like Ken, Holland, kind of like Ken Holland uh, liking his players, just despite them blowing it for the Red Wings, and he keeps well, I mean, overpaying. Right. Them. Yeah, and there's a difference between loyal teams to pitch. <coughs> I mean, I mean, you can yes. be loyal to players. Yeah, you can be loyal to players, and I, there are some players that will take lower pay to be part of a championship team and there are players that will want all they can get and you have to make that decision and it's a tough one it's, it's not easy but you have to make that decision if we let this guy go or if we don't offer him a contract that somebody else will are other free agents going to look at that and say hey this is where I want to go and Detroit fell victim to that a lot and the, the post cap era because they were signing guys to contracts that didn't make a, a ton of sense and they spent bad money after bad because then they were trying to retreat I'm sorry, they were trying to make up lost ground from the fact that they weren't able to, to match that success and when they wouldn't didn't make, match that success with the players that they assigned now you're in a really bad spot because you have to get you have to find some ways to, to work around that. And that's what happened to the Red Wings is they finally ran out of gas in the success rate in the success area, but they didn't have the assets to go out and improve the team. Yeah, well in that respect it was just a matter of the bill coming due. The bill is always due. Um, and in regards to some of these large contracts, in general, it's, it's almost regarded as an accepted rule of thumb. Eventually, it will be an albatross in the future, you know, whether it be midpoint of the, of, the, of the contract or at the very tail end. People knew A-Rod's contract was going to be a bad one when, when it was signed. Same thing with Prince Fielder. Thank God the Tigers were able to trade him to the right to be in Kinsley before he had his unfortunate neck injury. But again, it's the same thing would apply here. Like it wasn't. I think people are glad Mike Trout is there to take you know some of the gleam, uh, take some of the funk off of that contract. 
contract that they've given Albert Pujols because how many championships have they, have they won since making that signing? So, you know, it's it's always a high-risk, high-reward type of deal. But you want to do it because, like Buck said, if you're not going to pay for that player, someone else will, and it may lead be the difference between them winning a championship and you winning one. Yeah. Speaking of the Red Wings here, we're going to have a last-second change of plans here right about now and transition to them. The Red Wings start their 2018-2019 season season later this week. It's going to be, as I check out the NHL app, uh, the teams. There we go. Uh, the Red Wings host the Columbus Blue Jackets at home Thursday at 7.30 at Little Caesars Arena on Fox Sports Detroit. Um, before they before they did that, uh, after the preseason, they sent forward Philip Sedina to the Grand Rapids Griffins. Now, Prashant Thayer said on his Twitter at Iyer underscore Prashant that uh, it, gives, it gives other youngsters like Dennis Chalowski a chance to uh, be caught up to the NHL. Let, let me see here. As I scroll down. There we go. He, he tweeted, he quoted the Red Wings' official Twitter's tweet, the Red Wings today has just signed David Pope, Giovanni Smith, Dominic Turgeon, Philip Zadina, Billy Sarjavi, and Hari Sateri to the AHL's Grand Rapids Griffins at Griffins Hockey. He, and he said, right move, right move for Zadina also means we'll likely see Chalowski and Rasmussen with the team on opening night. Oh, with which team, the Griffins or the Red Wings, good chance to evaluate their progression at the at the pro at the pro level. Meaning, I think it means Chalowski and Michael Rasmussen may uh, may be called up to the NHL. Obviously, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they, I mean, the, the roster has been somewhat cemented. It's, it's not set yet. It's not been cured. But Rasmussen, Christopher Ann, and uh, Chalowski been told they're on the roster. Um, Joe Higgins, Libor Schlack, and Philip Ronick are still right now on the Red Wings roster due to the spate of injuries that have ravaged the Red Wings defense. Mike Green now with that fatigue issue. And then Cronwell and Erickson also nursing some injuries that they have not even been able to overcome so far. And they don't know what their stats are. They may end up uh, starting the season on injured reserve. Not yeah. long-term injured reserve like Zetterberg, but short-term in your reserve, which can last up to 10 games. And so they might be able to buy themselves some time there with, with putting those guys on the, the short-term injury reserve list. Um, if, if nothing changes in the, in the next 48 hours, I would assume that Joe Hickett, Shulak, and Hironik will all uh, be making the opening day roster. Mm-hmm. and being up with the big club. Now, out of those three guys, I'm guessing that Hickets would be the first one to get moved down, uh, then Hironic, and then Shulak, just by the things that I've been reading. Uh, they feel that Shulak is probably the most NHL-ready defenseman. Uh, didn't get to see much of him in Grand Rapids last year, but um, the very small bit I did see of him, he, he was pretty competent. Um, Hickets and Hironic are the two guys that people are really clamoring for his turn in terms of getting that defense into a younger mode and with Cronwell being injured as he most often is and also Erickson um, fighting off an injury. Um, I think that people will be pleased to see those guys on the roster. Now that's not going to translate into instant wins, I can tell you that because the inexperience and the youth of the roster is changing over. That means that you're going to struggle on the job. It means you're going to have some mistakes made that Maybe veterans don't make, but that's part of the process. And I think finally for the Red Wings turning the corner on some of these players that need to be put out to pasture or need to be, um, you know, just kind of left off the grid, so to speak, and, and kind of let them go their own way. Um, you know, this is kind of the beginning of that with Mike Green's issues, Cronwall, and also Erickson. Um, those are those are three guys that are. You know, even though they're veteran presences, um, 
you know, people are looking for a roster turnover, and this is starting to be the, starting to show that this indeed might be that that point where the Red Wings are starting to churn out a roster with a significantly lower average age than they have in years past. Right. The silver lining with these injuries, because like you said, it does give the opportunities for these young guns to uh, establish themselves and get their feet wet on the on the terms of the defense uh, aspect. I was able to catch some highlights of what they did the other night against uh, the Maple Leafs. Uh, Schluck looked pretty good out there as well. Um, Giovanni Smith, he's getting some ice time. We'll wonder if, if he'll pan out nicely as well. Um other, fla- other factors that, that play into this in terms of uh, the continued progress of other young stars, such as Dylan Larkin and, and Andres Asnesio, because some of those other guys, the, those, the latter I just mentioned, they're going to have to become your new leaders now because the old guard is starting to change over, if not changed over completely. Dotson is now gone. Zetterberg is obviously gone. He may be gone forever now. Um, Lips have already been gone, but still, it, it speaks to the point of we got we got to brace our, uh, prepare ourselves for how this generation of, of Red Wings will carry themselves, lead themselves, um, because they have a lot of standards to live up to, and you have to wonder will that pressure get to them, um, or will they be still flailing about in mediocrity limbo for now until what the next chance to get to draft the superstar talent. So it's still, like Buck mentioned, a process of, of how players are going to develop, how they can contribute, and then how the team as a whole can grow with making these new adjustments and new changes uh, to their overall makeup. Prashant Dyer, Prashant Dyer also tweeted, Marty Ferg's contract could almost entirely bear it if he were to clear, clear waivers. Ayers says he's also more okay with with Ferg sitting as the 13th forward if chosen. That the real decision here is who gets the 12th forward spots, Sveshnikov or Ferg. For Ayer, he favors Sveshnikov st- substantially because he doesn't, Ayer doesn't think Ferg offers you anything positive at 5-on-5 five five and defensively is a negative. Sveshnikov is younger, more talented, and has potential to aid 5-on-5 five five play. Well, that's true. I mean, and the other thing is Sveshnikov is drafted, whereas Burke, um, you know, even though he was a lower draft pick, has been in the system for a longer time. You kind of know more about what he can or can't do at the professional level or at the top professional level. And they were able to bring him on board for one year to contract just over a million dollars. But, I mean, they were doing that because this was kind of the devil you know. Um, you know, he's not a great five-on-five player. He's pretty limited in what his abilities are when it comes to what he can offer the team. But I would rather see Sveshnikov get a full tryout, so to speak, uh, at the NHL level because they need to see what he can do. I mean, he's, this will be his third year at the professional level after being drafted. And they need to know if they if they can count on him for a, a roster spot, and that he can grow into a serviceable NHL player, or if it's time to cut bait and see what they can get in return. Because there's only so many spots on a roster, and this is a team that's still uh, in the process of really kind of turning over um, what was the old guard. And, and is really trying to bring in some new players. And I think if they said that Burke deserves to be on uh, the, the forward lines more than Sveshnikov, that's more of an indictment on Sveshnikov than it is on Ferk. Mm-hmm. Anything else we should consider? Just one, one kind of surprise. I don't know if it's a surprise, but uh, Luke Borkowski who a lot of people can kind of pan that move when they signed him uh, before last season was put on waivers. And if he clears, which most people think he will, he'll be assigned to Grand Rapids, which will allow them to put his contract fully on the shoulders of the Griffins and remove them, uh, remove that from the cap space or the cap hit of the Detroit Red Wings. I want to see how uh, some of their goaltending uh, core evolves because Jimmy Howard's getting up there. He's getting 34. 
Uh, uh, they got John Bernier, but he's 30. So, other than that, you have some of these young guys like Fulcher's 20, Rybar 24, and Terry, the guy who, who was mentioned in the top buyers, but he's 28. So, I really want to see how, uh, how the gold tending depth runs and whether or not um, they need to still implement a committee uh, type of uh, role or someone will be able to develop and uh, impress someone uh, and have a breakout, a come out party to further impress and show that they will be potentially have a chance to be the long term starting goaltender. Yep. It'll be Jimmy Howard and Jonathan Bernier in the goaltending core. So, um, let's get to the coaches here. Jeff Blaschel, the head coach. Dan Bilesma, an assistant coach. Frank Vashner uh, earlier, a few a few months ago, pointed out that um, that that uh, this year could be Jeff Blaschel's last as the head coach of the Red Wings, and then Dan Bilesma may may be promoted to head coach afterwards. Any thoughts on that, Ed? Not all things are coincidental. Um, it's, uh, in my view, uh, not too bad insurance form to have. Uh, having the experience that Bosma has, uh, Detroit fans really know him very well since he coached the Penguins um, for those back-to-back years with the, the Wings and Penguins battle in the Stanley Cup Finals 2008-2009, respectively. Um, Bosma, though, does have a tendency of having an act that grows thin on you. Um, we even saw that happen to us. We're, 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 not, we're familiar with that before with, with Mike Babcock, so I'm not entirely sure how long a uh, tenure ship would last, um, especially if it was uh, you know, brought in as an emergency situation, just in case of the fire flash on midway through. So um, I'm still, the jury's still out on that, but it wouldn't surprise me if. Let's say the worst the nightmare scenario happens and they start out terrible. If they felt if they felt the need uh, to fire Blasio, there will be a reasonable excuse to do it right then and there, and then just have uh, Bosma give just give him the interim tag for however long uh, the season goes. Or if he wins enough games to remove it all. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty obvious that with, with the hiring of Dan Bosma. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a hidden message, and it's not very well hidden that Jeff Blashill really is kind of under the gun here because they expect him to start showing some progress. Now, that doesn't mean they want him to win the division. That doesn't mean they want him to, um, you know, usurp some of the teams that are above him that are consistently at that level, but they need to see some progress. And part of that is because of the roster uh, that has been given to him, and part of that is because his apprenticeship as an AHL coach is pretty much over. I mean, he's going to be entering his fourth season, and if if they're giving him younger players to work with, which is really his forte, um, they're expecting to see some progress, and Dan Bilesman is also one of those coaches that uh, has been labeled as kind of a a younger or a developmental type of coach. Um, Everybody remembers when he took over the Penguins in 2009 and won the Stanley Cup with that team. Not as much of a developmental situation there. But as he went on in Pittsburgh, kind of left the fans wanting for more, um, simply because as they continued on with their stretch, I mean, you had Cosby, Melkin, Flory, all those all those players that um, he inherited. Um, they weren't really developing some of the kids like they thought they should. And it can be tough. That's a balancing act for any coach especially a team like the Pittsburgh Penguins who have a lot of guys that are luminary players, certain to be Hall of Famers in their prime. Um, But they just didn't feel they were getting the same type of development that they should have. And Dan Bilesman was kind of noted as a guy that could do that kind of thing. And the same thing happened to him in Buffalo where they brought him on to a team that was um, quite poor and bereft of a lot of talent. Uh, They were able to draft some guys for him, Jack Eichel being uh, the main um, I, I would say a traction in that, but the, the, the Sabres did not show a lot of progress in his tenure, and they were hoping to, to get a little bit more. And again, 
you have to have realistic expectations. You look at a team like Buffalo, when he came on board, they were simply brutal. And I, I think that when you look at his overall tenure at Buffalo, they didn't get the same type of results, kind of like the Pittsburgh Penguins did, uh, as far as developing the players the way that they thought they should have been developing. So um, it's, it, it, it's something to, to say for, for Blashfield that says, hey, you know, if, we, if you can't get it done and we have somebody on the bench that's going to be able to at least take over and has that experience, uh, at the same time, I don't think that Dan Bilesma has any aspirations of just, um, you know, coming in and yanking Jeff Blashill off the throne and becoming uh, the head coach. But at the same time, obviously, that's the main goal. You don't want to be an assistant forever. You want to be a head coach. And for him to take that spot, not only being a Michigan native, but also seeing the opportunity that if Jeff Blashill's team does not perform and doesn't show development in these young players, they're now giving him... Um, I would say, you know, giving him the opportunity to coach, um, you know, that can turn into a bad situation really quickly. And if they get out of the gate really bad and don't show any sort of improvement, um, you know, Jeff Blanchel could get out and Dan Bilesman could, could take the, re the rest of the season and then they would make a decision from there. Uh, and that's what, that's what the coaching business is. If you're, if you're not winning and you're not showing and you can't show your work, um, you're not going to be there for very long. So, um, Jeff Blashill has had um, head coaches or guys that have had head coaching experience in the past on his staff, um, but it really hasn't been much of a threat. Because those are guys that were really, I would say, not looking at having prospects of, of getting a head coaching job anytime soon. Um, but now you come to a point where these younger players are being put in his at his disposal, and if they don't see the results that they want, um, you know, they, and it was all the other turmoil um, swirling about about Ken Holland, Steve Eiserman saga. Um, you know, this is a, a, a real crunch time for Jeff Blashill because they've not been good the past three years. And again, I don't expect them to jump into a hundred point team and win the division, but at the same time, you want to see some of those young players develop. And so you can show that progress, and if that doesn't happen, uh, Dan Bilesma is the fail-safe there. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, pretty much all we, all we covered. The players, the general manager, the, the coaches, the goaltenders. That's all we previewed for the Red Wings. So we're going to transition to college football and begin with the Michigan Wolverines. The Wolverines fell behind 17 to nothing, which was surprising to me. But then when when it came to the came time for the second half, they started to slowly but surely come back and they they got a touchdown very late. And they were able to uh, hang on for the 20 to 17 win. Karan Higdon, the five-yard touchdown run with 4.06 left, and that stood to be the game winner. Shea Patterson, 15 of 24 for 196 yards. No touchdown passes, but no interceptions either. Clayton Thorson, 16 of 27 for 174 yards. No touchdowns, no interceptions. Man. Um, Karan Higdon was very key. He scored two touchdowns, including the game winner. He got he got them on the board at first, too. And then the Wolverines kicked two field goals from 23 and 24 yards out. Quinn Nordine doing the honors. But um, Michigan scored first, actually, with 9-14 left in the second quarter. That became, that That started a very slow comeback, but very manageable, to be honest with you, a very manageable enough comeback for the Wolverines to win a game. Ed, your analysis, please. Yeah, coming into this one, um, people were thinking this was probably going to be 
not as much of, of a romper as it was, uh, say, versus the scene of rest, but at least a more comfortable victory. But um, it was proven to be just, in fact, the opposite. In fact, going back to the last couple times that these teams have played each other, especially in Evanston, everybody knows about the infamous game in 2000 with Anthony Thomas fumbled the ball, 54-51, that sort of deal. Uh, there was also, I think, what, the 2013 encounter that went to triple overtimes. Uh, 2014, the the game where what was it the that uh, 2013 or 2014? But where I remember the game where the team had to literally rush out the field goal unit and just get the staff off in time to get the game time field goal set in overtime. Uh, that was one of the most wildest sequences I've ever seen. So, um, whenever Michigan plays Northwestern, especially in Evanston, expect some craziness to usually go down. I was, I guess, foolhardy in, in trying to uh, uh, disregard that. But still, gotta give credit to Pat Fitzgerald. He had his team prepared. The crowd was ready for it. They were pumped. Um, we talk about having as great a start as you could possibly get. Um, virtually mistake free football for Northwestern, emotional fire that play, 17 nothing lead. Uh, Michigan looked to be on the ropes. You were thinking, oh God, what the heck's going to happen now? But give credit to Michigan and Harbaugh and the coaching staff for keeping the players in check, keeping them composed so they could show that resiliency. Uh, overcome the slow start that they had. It was, you know, basically this was giving me some similarities to the Notre Dame game, which in, makes sense because this was their first true road game since Notre Dame. Um, so it was, maybe it was giving them reminders of that, that that, that gave them that second win or that inner instinct to overcome uh, the adversity this time as opposed to Notre Dame because they responded much better, much better this time around as they did against Notre Dame opening night. Uh, this marks also, it should be noted, that this was, I believe, the largest deficit over uh, ever overcome uh, in a game during the Jim Harbaugh era for Michigan. So that is the first. Granted, it's against Northwestern, but you, you want to take the accomplishments whenever you can get them so it will show character for your team. Um, there are some things, though, that, that was obviously concerning that they need to get a better, a better grip on. One has got to be penalties. Too many penalties on both sides of the ball. Penalties have found a way. If there is a kryptonite for this team and how well they perform, or one of their, their, their biggest weaknesses is that for every great play they make, this is they almost, almost always seem to make a dumb penalty two or three plays later, even during the play that they usually make great. Uh, too many holding calls, too many uh, that, that take away great runs. Um, Pass interference calls, I kind of expect those because the way they play press coverage constantly with their defenders and their secondary, you know, more often than not, you're going to get your, your baby up pass interference calls. You know, it, it makes you a good, you know, help the good team stand out. The great team stand out is to win, uh, being able to avoid those type of calls on a consistent basis. So they've done a, a good job of not getting flat for those constantly, but that's the risk that you take when you play uh, press coverage. Um, other penalties, such as the holding plays during, um, and we'll get to a certain play later on, but still, uh, it's quite frustrating because whenever Patterson seemed to make a play with his feet or uh, Hickman had a good run, the whole play will be called bad because of a dumb holding penalty. You know, there was a couple plays down the stretch where I had to hold my breath for a second because, wait, where's the flag? But thankfully, it didn't come. So that is one certain aspect because whenever Michigan does not have did not have a penalty in their offensive drive for the most part, they were to, they were able to move smoothly um, and flawlessly, essentially. So the lack of self inflicted wounds would be a much better uh, strategy for them in terms of uh, having uh, an established better start in the opening quarters and being more consistent throughout the entire game. Um, as for how everything came about, with that whole, with one of that last, those last controversial calls was the, what was the holding penalty on Higdon when it clearly showed that Higdon was um, getting tackled. Okay. He was called for a holding penalty. It was quite uh, weird to see. But still, Michigan was able to overcome that, overcome all that adversity, 
and making great plays, showing great compo- uh, great composure, and their defense just being absolutely phenomenal. Chase Winovich is looking like an NFL player every single week. Uh, they got uh, Hudson back, their Viper linebacker back, because he was out because of the, uh, the targeting penalty. So his punishment was a suspension. He was back. Um, it was, and of course, Devin Bush, just my goodness, the speed that he shows uh, um, on practically every play, whether he's pursuing the ball maker, uh, the ball handler or not, is just frightening to see. Uh, between the defense getting the sacks that they needed, um, making stops, making adjustments, because, again, they were getting lit up, but then after they got after they got 17 nothing, they didn't give them a single point the rest of the way. Um, practically shutting them entirely down in terms of like preventing them from moving the ball in the second half. Uh, getting off the field on third downs better than they did in the first half. That one was a concerning worry as well. Um, so you have Chase Winovich doing what he's doing, Devin Bush doing what he's doing, with Sean Gary, uh, Martellus, Hudson, the, you know, the names go on and on. Um, you can uh, breathe easy a little bit of if your offense isn't doing too well so far. But uh, it's good to see the offense, you know, backing up the defense this time as opposed to the Notre Dame game. And while that was a scare, it still has you on track to possibly get to the 10 win mark before you play Ohio State. The only remaining hurdle or school I see, honestly, on that schedule is Penn State. Um, I think Wisconsin looks more beatable um, than, than what we thought previously. I definitely, certainly think Michigan State is more beatable than what we've seen at since the start of the season. And really, if you had any worries about um, reaching that 10 1 plateau, um, the two teams that bothered you were obviously Penn State and Ohio State. And now that looks even more to be the case as the rest of the schedule shapes up. Um, Michigan is. Uh, at the top of their spot in the division. So even if they were to, say, lose to Wisconsin, it wouldn't hurt their chances from a divisional aspect because it was a divisional opponent. But with these division games coming up soon, MSU, Penn State, and OSU, uh, those are your gimme. Those are the ones that are going to determine whether or not you go to Indy. So it was on Michigan to further establish this uh, uh, progression of what they're doing, what they've done with their offense, uh, to get themselves ready because if they have a slow start against Wisconsin, they're not winning. Same thing against Penn State and certainly against Ohio State. I don't even throw on Michigan State for good measure. If they have that kind of start in those games that like they did on Saturday, they're gonna lose. There's no there's no doubt about it. Buck? Yeah, I mean usually it does a pretty good job of, of putting the analysis out there and, and there's not a lot for me to clean up. I would say that um, because they started so poorly and because they have done so numerous times on the road when you're talking about Michigan, um, they did it again. And I don't think that this is a pattern that you can really look at and say, boy, this is great. Um, when it happens time and time again, um, that's something that they're really going to have to do better if they want to beat teams that are uh, the team that they want to have to beat if they want to be uh, a Big Ten title contender. Yep, Michigan improves to four and one, and and uh, improves to two and zero in Big Ten play. They're home against Maryland Saturday at noon on ABC. Michigan drops one spot to 15 in the AP poll. So, um, any thoughts on that? I think that was warranted because the way they performed against Northwestern, yeah, you hung on, you got the win, but that was a lot of pretty games. So even though there were some teams ahead of you that lost and lost in convincing fashion, uh, the way the fact that you weren't as thoroughly convincing with your, uh, excuse me, with your, uh, on your end of the bargain with, with Northwestern, uh, that impacted more than anything on why they fell that spot behind. All right, so uh, 
unfortunately for Buck Gino, um, um, he uh, ha he uh, has to leave. Uh, are, are you coming back, Buck? Um, pr probably not. So uh, we'll uh, go ahead and uh, we'll just uh, go ahead and uh, transition to Michigan State football. Touchdown, MSU! The Spartans um, let the Chippewas hang around for a little bit, but uh, but they they started pulling away before they let that happen. Um, they were down three nothing after one quarter of play, obviously. And and Brian Lewerke in the first quarter, when they looked like they were going to get into the end zone for an easy touchdown, he threw an interception. But but then he adjusted to that with two rushing touchdowns of his own on quarterback keepers. And then Michigan State started to uh, pull away and lead 31-3. to And then CMU tried to make a comeback with 17 unanswered points. But Michigan State... When they had the ball last, they ran out the rest of the clock, and then they took a knee to finish it off. They went 31-20. to 20. Ed, what was your analysis on both teams? My thoughts, well, it was like, um, I guess Michigan took their, their cue from MSU Michigan State. in terms yep. of the, oh, the yeah. slow start. Uh, in terms of the slow start um, um, phase of, of how you wanted to play this game, Um it was quite weird to see, but it was nice to see eventually, though, know, the cream rise to the top. MSU, this was his team in terms of pure talent on paper. They could have beaten this team in their sleep. And I think it seemed they were asleep for that first quarter because giving up field position, the Lewerke interception, it might just feel uneasy. But eventually they woke up, and their talent proved to be better than their guts and their tenacity. Um, they also were able to... Let's see how many turnovers they got. Yeah, they won the turnover battle as well, which was a real big key here. Um, that was essential. That was the difference between Michigan State um, having the 31-3 lead that they had or Central making us a dogfight throughout the entire game. Um, between that also and they were not being a complete uh, hazard to MSU's chances to win as opposed to other games. They were able to skate by and get the victory that they needed on this. Um, it was inter interesting to see that Michigan State was able to uh, accomplish all of this without three necessary key players on their offense. No L.J. Scott for the second straight game. Um, no Jalen Naylor, who had the big touchdown sealer against Indiana. He did not play, and this was probably even the, the worst news of all. Their top receiver, Cody White, broke his hand during the game um, against Central. So he's going to be out for an extended period of time. You don't know when or where, but it's it was like the worst possible timing if you're, if you're MSU to have this happen to you. Oh, now, man. in terms of when he, he gets back, I wouldn't be surprised if he tries to, uh, to tough it all out and be ready for Michigan. But if he's not, if his hand is not ready, is he, he won't play. And it's very unfortunate. But, um, yeah, Cody White's injury was probably the last thing they needed. But um, especially before they head into the strength of the schedule with the defenses that they're, they're going to be facing coming up. But um, for MSU, it was just a needed win to get. But uh, I wouldn't feel too confident about how the rest of the season is going to shape up. Yeah, that said, they um, um, they they move up one spot to number twenty in the AP poll, and after losing Cody White to that broken hand injury, uh, Cody White, in terms in terms of him, better safe than sorry. I would I would have I would have to uh, sit him out for the Michigan game, the in-state rivalry game. And and um, wait wait until like later in even later in the season, but um, hopefully he's not out for the rest of the season. Yeah, that'll be the worst case scenario here. Yeah, Michigan is home against Northwestern Saturday at noon on FS1. So uh, let's get into those college football on the mitten quick picks. We're gonna just gonna pick predict two games here. 
Time now for the college football and the mitten quick picks. We'll start with the Maryland Terrapins and the Michigan Wolverines. Uh, let me see here. Maryland at Michigan, Saturday at noon on ABC. Well, Maryland seems to be in a complete free fall right now with what they've been going on through, the, uh, of course, the Jordan McNair um, scandal and situation in terms of that young football player dying. Uh, after after a workout session or team practice or whatever it was, so that has been a, a, a horrific distraction to uh, lower morale, not just within the program but in, in the entire school and the university itself. And it's been reflected, I think. Well, not hopefully, thankfully, it's not been reflected too much in their record. And they've had gotten out to a three and one start. They've beaten Texas, but. They did lose the Temple. The Temple. 30, they, they gave up 35 points to Temple. The Owls. Yeah. So that is very concerning and also concerning to how they do They do give up an average of over 100 yards on the ground. This will be a game you would expect Karan Hickton, um, or, or not necessarily Hickton individually, in the running back by committee of Hickton, uh, Drew Hudson and hopefully returning Chris Evans to help get the running game established. You hope for Shea Patterson to have a much bigger game. I expect him to. Spread is 17 and a half. Michigan's at home. Um, is it the homecoming game officially or no? Let me look on mgoblue.com here. Yeah, because I think this might be homecoming if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you're listening to episode. 336 of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, the Win Review Edition. Taylor Phillips with Ed Smith. Follow me. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at DT2Phillips and EdSmith313. Buck Gino has uh, left early because uh, uh, due to an undisclosed reason. We uh, w- we wish him uh, the, the best. Welcome him back next week. Going to mgoblue.com's football schedule. Yes, it is homecoming. So, homecoming weekend, yeah, I, I think Michigan's going to do a much better job uh, with their uh, expected spread and whatnot uh, for this one, um, as opposed to, to what they did against Northwestern. So, I think Michigan will win this one by a score of 45 to 14. All right. I'm going to pick Michigan to win 49 to 10. So, how about Michigan State at home against Northwestern Saturday at noon on FS1? I think MSU, they got to be careful with this one because if they have the same start that they get against Central and against Mm -hmm. Northwestern, they're going to be in in a heap of trouble. Uh, Northwestern may have their pride, may have had be coming off of a mental lapse, you know, a mental hangover after dealing with the devil of Michigan. Uh, so they may be a little bit more ripe and weakened. They are one and three for a reason. They their record they are what their record says they are. I mean, you lost to Duke, you lost to Akron for God's sakes. So uh, yeah, you gave give you credit for handling handling your own against Michigan, but when it came down to it, uh, you are what your record says you are. So there's no there's no way around it. So MSU they should have a much better time around. Um, establishing the run, uh, having a much better start with offensively, um, and not having uh, very weird plays to let that the result in dumb decisions or turnovers like they did against Central. So MSU should be able to win this one. I'm going to say 28-13. Low scoring affair. MSU's defense uh, settles it out the whole way. Yeah, not to mention their offensive coordinator, Dave Warner, continues to make bad play calls because he's a bad play caller, like even Frank Vaginer pointed out. Yeah, you, you, you've done the same thing to Dave Warner after the loss to Arizona State. Yeah, it's been that way for years, so. Yeah, the Spartans need a new offensive coordinator, really. They need a lot of things. Yeah, but especially they need to get rid of Dave Warner. So, gonna 
transition from college to pro football. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! Oh my gosh. I, I mean, really? The Lions? Uh, of all teams... Coming back from down two scores to to take a 24-23 lead on a Golden Tate touchdown with uh, 2.17 left. And then their defense allows, uh, especially Joan, uh, especially Davis, allows a deep catch by Ezekiel Elliott, sell, setting up a game-winning 38-yard field goal by Dan Maher as time expired. You blew it! And the Lions defense is the, is the one scapegoat that I have in my head right now. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, I'm so used to being thoroughly, soul-crushingly, heartbreakingly disappointed and let down by this team that this loss, while annoying, didn't necessarily aggravate or irritate me as previous ones have done in years past. Again, that speaks to how numb I've become watching this team over the, my past 25 years of life. That being said, uh, this was this is the one. This was a game you wanted to win. You wanted to have, you know, for your psyche after building off of the great performance you had last week against the Patriots. Not to mention the fact that it comes down to it at the end of the year. This will be a potential tiebreaker game. So you, this was a game that you wanted and had to win. They just couldn't get done. Uh, a lot of things worked against them. The fact that um, the one thing that was almost a constant narrative uh, leading up to this game was Ezekiel Elliott has to get the ball more often than not, has to get more touches more often than not. And you saw that he had, what, over 240 yards of combined total offense. Uh, that's insane, not to mention the, the – touchdowns and the uh, the big play at the end. Uh, so essentially, Ezekiel Elliott was the difference maker in a real close game. Um, I will say with the wheel route that was run, it was like, wow, that was a bad time for Jared Davis to get beat by that wheel route. Like the absolute worst of times to let that route beat you was right at the end of the game. Um, it's unfortunate uh, that the pass rush can get up there one more second a uh, bit sooner. Uh, it was Deshaun had. I did notice him give him that strip sack of, of that press out earlier, but it was just man, after that effort, seeing the offense battle back, you know, Jim Bob Cooter actually calling a good game for the second week in a row. I'm like, I'm surprised here. You know, you saw them using the run more to set up the passing down the field. You saw Carry on Johnson um, having uh, another solid game where he's getting more comfortable into the groove of, 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 of his NFL career with each week. Um, had a punishing touchdown run where he laid the guy out. He, the guy who was trying to defend and probably gave him a concussion. You hope the guy's okay. Um, you know, other players, you know, Kenny Galladay making a great catch, other players getting involved offensively, Golden Tate just having a spectacular game. Like, he is, you know, one of, if not the most fun person to watch whenever he catches the ball because you know he's going to be, he's going to be moving around and dancing and doing whatever uh, moves he needs to do to move that ball uh, and, and get more yards. He's a yak king, you know, he's a yak just a consumer, yards after catch, yards after contact. He just—he's one of the hardest people to ever get down whenever he catches, especially when he's in open space. So, seeing the offense do all that, battle back, and everything—it was just it's just a little bit disappointing, you know, uh, to, to see him not pull it out. But when you have things such as one player being a difference maker, when you have things such as penalties. Penalties, penalties, penalties. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, on defense. It's exactly rearing its ugly head at the worst possible moments. Three consecutive holding penalties in one Dallas Cowboy offensive drive. That's what uh, that's what really annoyed and aggravated yeah. me. Yeah, because what? That's going to extend drives, keep you on the field longer, and give them more cracks to score points. That's exactly what eventually happened. And at the end, it just came down to the fact that, you know, the narrative was going to be, we're not going to let Zeke Elliott beat us. We're going to force Dak Prescott to beat us. Well, both kind of happened. Zeke got his got, uh, 
got his uh, his stats, his production, got his uh, 240 yards, got his touchdown, and he made the big catch at the end. But it was Dak Prescott who made the throw at the end. So you got a double whammy in that scenario, and it's just tough loss, tough loss. But I think this will be a growing one. I, I know it's disappointing, but I can't. This is one of the few times you're going to actually hear me be optimistic about the Lions after a loss because I think this is actually a, this will be a growing one. For some of the players on this team, and for Matt Patricia as well, for him to be uh, this young into his coaching tenure. Yeah, the Lions. Still fall to one and three, but it's going to be a process, just a compromise. Uh, it's, it wasn't Matt Patricia's fault. I, again, I blame the defense for uh, blowing this game in large part. Too many penalties, and they allowed the Zeke catch and the game-winning field goal by Dan Meyer in result. And that's the defense has to be play more discipline and play better, play better coverage. That, that's it. Yep. And they're going to have to work on that prior to Sunday at home at Ford Field against, you know who, the Green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers, and Clay Matthews coming to, coming to town. The guy who uh, two weeks, t- who uh, a week ago, prior to, the, prior to this podcast, got, got uh, incorrectly flagged for roughing the passer, well, sort of, Except he threw his threw most of his body weight on the Redskins quarterback. Was it Kirk Cousins or does he still play for uh, the Redskins or was it who Kirk else? Cousins? No, no, Alex Smith. It Alex was, Smith. Yes, that's yeah, right. Alex Thank Smith, you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, the former San Francisco 49er and former Kansas City Chief. Yes, but um, we'll see how Clay Matthews uh, factors in. For the Packers' defense against the against the Lions' offense, another another thing that uh, that I was I was baffled is Matthew Stafford threw too many was standing there in the pocket during too many offensive plays, and he got sacked a few times. And yeah. he, threw, he 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 just he just stood there in the pocket he, when he could have scrambled. As bad as the offensive line was at times, there, there was still at least a little bit of room for him to scramble, and he didn't do that. Maybe not at all. Well, I think Stafford felt he was getting good co- enough, good, comfortable protection. I thought the protection of that, uh, them was much better later on in the, in the fourth quarter. Yeah, he gave up a sack or so, but still, like in that last drive, perfect protection all the way through. So I didn't mind that. Gave Stafford the time that he needed to find his, his receivers and with the throws. Um, but yeah, it was just, just those little things. Really, when it, it came to when you come down to do it, this was just a back and forth game between two uh, practical. Essentially, even teams. I think these teams are going to have close to the same record, if not the same record, at the end of the season. And it's just this, this tiebreaker scenario that came to play. It just came down to that 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 play by Dak Zeke essentially was the difference. So. Yeah, um, yeah, but even even if uh, Stafford had had good enough pocket protection, he still would have at least tried to consider even moving in at least one direction. You know, he's got to he's got to be at least aware, at least more aware of uh, any uh, pocket penetration from the opposing defensive front. I think he is. I think if you've noticed in, in recent years him being more uh, showing more mobility than, than not. But uh, uh, if he feels that he's in a good rhythm good rhythm and in a good groove with, with how he's throwing the ball. He's going to be, he's going to trust his own his line to give him the protection that he needs. Yeah, absolutely. So, the the Packers apparently take care of the Bills. Last I saw, they were up 19 to nothing. They probably won. Yeah, it was a 22 nothing shutout. Yeah, absolutely. Packers uh, improved to, what record are they? They're 2-1 and one now. Two and one. They had. They already had an early bye week, uh, so yeah. So, just uh, analysis and prediction. That's all we need. Well, essentially, this is a game where I, I expect this to be back and forth. The Packers have not looked particularly strong. Um, the two and one record is uh, probably a little bit more uh, disguised than what it really is. I still see the defense having problems. I still see 
you know, honestly, there's just there's got to be some problems with the old line when when uh, Aaron Rodgers is on one leg, we're not, and we're even a quarter of the way through the season yet. So, or, or officially, we are at least for the Lions' standpoint. They played four games. The Packers have only played three, but that's because they're early bye week. Nonetheless, um, this is, this seems to be a game where Aaron Rodgers always finds the way to make some type of BS happen, and he beats the Lions. So, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. Um, my score prediction, because I see this as a way to where I can't get my hopes up because, what, they always let me down anyway. But I want to be more realistic. I think the Packers, they got a better quarterback in this matchup. Uh, the more versatile player in Rodgers, who seems to make the impossible always possible. And the fact that, uh, you know, you still have good players on that defense that, can, that know Stafford well by this point and could be able to capitalize on some mistakes that he make. So I see that as factors uh, as to why I think the Packers will win this game. I I would say it goes down to the wire, maybe a 28-24 kind of, you know, I see Green Bay winning this one, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I, would, I would predict about the same, probably, probably 27 to 25, probably something like that. Interesting score. Yeah. Yep. So, um, uh, before we uh, get into our what's your what's your great segment, um, uh, Jeff Moss was tweet, tweeting something about Golden Tate. Um, can Can you elaborate elaborate on that a little bit more? He uh, took it. He, he tweeted a photo of Golden Tate and it and his um, significant other or whatever. Uh, I have, this is the first I've heard of that. Hold on one moment, please. You can follow Jeff Moss on Twitter at Barb Rady McCoskey. He is the founder uh, okay. of the Detroit Sports Rag website. So, uh, what did you find out? Basically, okay, it's, it may it may not be as widely known, but um, for, for those that, that have listened to us before, I think it was mentioned briefly that... Uh, Golden Tate is a Donald Trump supporter, apparently, um, and Jeff Moss, <laughs> he took an opportunity, uh, found a convenient excuse to post a, a picture of him supporting Trump, but, but the, the, the background, the setup to this it was uh, Kyle M- uh, Minky, um, was he, I think he's on M Live, I believe, if not, or, or he's, he's one of the uh, circulations that's covered the Lions. Um, he had a story out, uh, which was the headline of Golden Tate is a showman, both in production and theatrics. Now he's trying to learn how to not be a, quote, douchebag. And then, in response to that, Moss posts a picture without caption of Golden Tate and his wife uh, all standing next together, wearing the, of course, the Trump red Make America Great Again hats. Have, which, by the way, on a personal note, it's it's that look has almost essentially ruined red baseball caps for me forever. I hate that it's done that, but it's it's just yeah. <laughs> you know, if you were make another comment, it were, you would say that the red hats are a new um, uh, symbolism for what something else is. But that's another topic for another day. Point being, though, it was Moss finding a I think probably an opportunity to take a, a dig at Tate. And also probably make some irony over the fact that uh, Minky had this story about Golden Tate, Golden Tate trying not to be a douchebag, and yet here you are with your wife openly supporting a known douchebag. What irony? Yeah, I would I would say for that uh, I would say uh, you know um, it it's like making America crappy again. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's in. Yeah, it's more like making America insane. Yeah, we need to find a way to make America sane again after when all when all this is said and done. Right. Hopefully, Gretchen now, Whitmer wins the uh, governor uh, battle. Yeah, but but apparently there was an update though. There was like a update in the thread where let's see. Apparently, tape. Now, obviously, this is an old photo from like a couple years back or whatever it is. If it's real or not, you 
be the judge. But um, apparently, Golden Tate, he already had uh, his, his uh, share his thoughts on this matter. This was last year, last March, I guess, when that photo originally surfaced. He said, quote, is this a joke? We 100% did not wear uh, MAGA hats our wedding weekend in Mexico for our wedding. And I, well, I don't know how many zeros is that. I gotta, I'm not going to repeat all that. But basically, it's, 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 a, it's a way of saying I do not support Donald Trump. It's just what he's trying to say. Um, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's him trying to cover his backside because those photos look pretty darn real to me. Like, I don't see where does the Photoshop end and the, and the realness begin. Like, no, that was that's a legit head. Plus, Golden strikes me as... Well, I'm not going to get in the, in, in the full depth on air because that, that'll be, it's just not the parameters of that, but it wouldn't surprise me if he was uh, this type of person, this type of supporter of Donald Trump. It just wouldn't surprise me. Right. There are, and there are a lot of them out there in America, maybe, maybe uh, in, in other continents as well, which is embarrassing. But that being said, it's time for the What's Your Grade segment. Pencils down, everyone. It's time to find out what's your grade. And hopefully the Facebook ads uh, approve my uh, my uh, boosting at, at the Facebook ads department uh, in, in approves my boosting ad uh, when I uh, say it does not in, include political content because I don't think I don't think it's if it's if it's uh, if it's not much, it, it could still if there's if there's still it, it can still be a little if bit. The topic rightly calls for. We'll discuss it, but we're this is not the, the avenue nor platform to try to inject our personal matters. You can kind of get the gist of uh, how we how we roll by how we talk and speak, but still, you know, we can we can definitely agree that it's it's not the time nor place nor platform to talk about that interject that type of. Uh, culture into this specific type of culture unless there was a topic where both of those merged. Right. That being said, Golden, Golden Tina is Lions losing. Uh, the Lions defense is the first to grade. What's your grade, Ed? The defense gets a D. Um, yeah. I did not like how how I did not like seeing them giving up uh, constant third down conversions, extended long drives. Um, you know, basically blowing the great game that the offense have had. It was just disappointing um, and just just mild annoyance that that, that that was able to happen. So the defense gets a D from my view. I'm going to hit it right over the head with a shovel and hit him with a high and give it a D minus. They blew the freaking game! Yeah. Nice coverage, Gerard Davis, you bum! Take that. I think Gerard Davis, he, he seemed pretty remorseful. I, I saw uh, post-game footage. He looked pretty remorseful over that. And he's still young. He'll use this, hopefully, as a learning lesson for him. Yep. Ho- hopefully he learns. Otherwise, there's going to be trouble. Second and final event to grade is the Red Wings sending Philip Zadina down to the Grand Rapids Griffins in order to make room for Dennis Chalowski and Michael Rasmussen to be called up and see some NHL time with the Red Wings. What's your grade on that? Uh, just an average of the road to see. I think Zadina has some promise, but they're just doing this to make, uh, to make the best available room for their roster so that way everything's not too jumbled. Eventually, there will be a spot, a, a scenario where all these young guys are going to be on because, again, the, the old guard is going to be changing soon one way or another. Uh, but for now, it was just, you know, it's a neutral type of decision, so this is going to get a neutral grade. See. Yeah, did you did you feed off on, on any of the analysis uh, that Buck laid out on uh, Zadina, Chalowski, and Rasmussen earlier in this episode? Yeah, uh, in terms of how eventually it could be a spot where we could see at least two of those three on opening night. I'm not sure how it will be throughout the season if we can get all of them in there. Uh, but Chalowski, Chalowski, he's, I, I think he scored a goal or so, and then the last game he showed some promise. 
So it will be interesting to see if how how well he does throughout the, throughout the course of the season. And since he's getting that head start of being there opening night, he'll probably give him a good chance to, to uh, get himself interwoven with, the, with, with how the NHL rolls. Yeah. So that's our What's Your Great segment. So for our audience, if they have a grade for those two events, each of them, post them in the comment bank in this episode, and please don't go out of line. Ed Smith, uh, great job by you and Buck Gino, although we had to leave earlier for some uh, more important matters. He'll be back next week. We thank him for letting us know about that privately off uh, while we were on the air. Um, it, thankfully, he was prof- more professional about it. Um, that Thank being said, so yeah, absolutely. So anyone, anyone else would have done the same, but that being said, excellent job. We'll talk to you both next week on episode 337. No problem. I'm already looking forward to it. Take care. Yep, absolutely. So before we sign off, um, just an announcement that the Michigan Sports Truth podcast is being added to the Stables Network Wednesday, October 17th, when Jeff Moss of the Detroit Sports Rag joins me for a one-hour primetime show starting at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Our special thanks and shout-out go to Mark Mancini of the Stables Network for giving us all a chance, for giving us both a chance, rather, me and Jeff Moss. And we want to remind everyone to share this episode and our entire podcast on social media and have their friends share that as well. Because we want to tell them that the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast is searching for a wider online audience that is fans of sports. So please, spread the word about the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Spreaker, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts via iTunes, Google Play on its podcast app, and Spotify, as well as its verified Facebook page, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, and its Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram IGTV accounts at Michigan underscore truth. I'm Taylor Phillips. Follow me on Twitter at, and Instagram at DT2 Phillips, Buck Gino on Twitter at Buck Gino the Third, and Ed Smith on Twitter and Instagram at Ed Smith313. We'll talk to you next week in episode 337. Thanks very much for listening, downloading, and sharing. Stay start, stay smart, Michiganders. TTFN Tata for now. The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And mission complete.